Today's discussion is about mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation refers to one of the valves inside the heart, and valves are similar to doorways. The heart itself is like a four-room house where blood flows from chamber one to chamber two, two to three, three to four, and then four out to the body. And between each of those chambers, there's valves. And valves are like doorways where they open to allow blood to go forward, but then when blood flows from one chamber to the next chamber, that valve is supposed to close. In some people, that valve doesn't close well. So when blood pumps forward, that valve itself doesn't close and some blood pumps backwards. It doesn't leak out of the heart, it just goes back to the chamber where that blood came from. The mitral valve is the valve that separates the left atrium and the left ventricle. The left ventricle is what pumps blood out to the body. The left atrium is essentially a reservoir that puts blood into the left ventricle. So when blood flows from the left atrium to the left ventricle, the mitral valve opens. When the left ventricle pumps blood out to the body, the mitral valve is supposed to close, and then the next valve in front of it, which is the aortic valve, opens and allows blood to go forward. In some people, that mitral valve doesn't close well. And when it doesn't close, blood goes back into the left atrium. In order to maintain enough blood out to the body, the left ventricle then needs to pump a little more blood total because some is going forward and some is going backwards. Mitral regurgitation, if mild, as long as patients' blood pressures are well controlled, they don't smoke and their weight is fine, usually progresses very slowly, meaning over years to decades. The most important things are controlling blood pressure. For example, if you have a blood pressure of 110, then the left ventricle needs to generate a pressure of 120 to get blood to go forward. Well, that pressure of 120 is what pushes the mitral valve backwards. If somebody's blood pressure is 150 or 160, then the left ventricle needs to generate a pressure of 160 or 170, and that's how much force is pushing the mitral valve backwards. So each time the heart beats, if it's generating a higher pressure, that's more force that's pushing the mitral valve back. So once people are diagnosed with mitral regurgitation, it's important to control the blood pressure. By the same token, if somebody has a body mass index of 35 compared to a body mass index of 22 or 23, that's 50% more body that that left ventricle has to pump blood forward to, and that much more force needs to be generated to get blood forward that also pushes the mitral valve backwards more. So when people are diagnosed with mitral regurgitation, we're very, yeah, that didn't come up. It pause there, but. So when people are diagnosed with mitral valve prolapse, it's more important in that specific person than in the general population to make sure the blood pressure is well controlled and that person's weight is well controlled. The way we diagnose it initially is by listening to somebody's heart with a stethoscope. Sometimes people with mitral regurgitation don't have much of a heart murmur, so it's not always easy to hear. And the murmur just relates to flow which is abnormal. With a valve that opens normally and closes completely, there's no turbulent flow. If you live in a house in a windy area and you hear a whistling around the window, the whistling around the window is turbulent flow going through a small crack that's not supposed to be there. That's the same sound that we hear with the stethoscope where if there's a little opening in the mitral valve, the blood squeezing backwards, that sound that we hear is called a murmur. Sometimes mitral regurgitation you can hear it, sometimes mitral regurgitation you can't hear a murmur, so sometimes it's diagnosed that patients are getting an ultrasound for some other reason, and we realize that they have a leaky mitral valve. Other patients will hear a murmur, and will do the ultrasound, the result of the murmur, and then we can assess the severity of the mitral regurgitation. Mitral valve prolapse was a very common diagnosis 20 or 30 years ago, and mitral valve prolapse can be associated with mitral regurgitation and sometimes people have mitral valve prolapse and don't have any mitral regurgitation. What mitral valve prolapse is, valves are supposed to open and then close, and they close almost like a tent structure where it opens completely and it closes like this. Mitral valve prolapse refers to part of that mitral valve going below the base of the valve itself. So if part of that leaflet goes backwards, that's what mitral valve prolapse is. Mitral valve prolapse can happen in the valve can still tent and have no regurgitation or it can prolapse backwards and have a very big opening and a lot of mitral regurgitation. But mitral valve prolapse and mitral regurgitation are not synonymous. They are associated with each other, but they are not similar diagnoses. The treatment for mitral regurgitation 
As I said earlier, initially is controlling risk factors, which is mainly blood pressure. It's the most important thing in weight. Eventually, people often need to get, if they have significant weight regurgitation, their valve replaced or repaired. And there's different ways of replacing and repairing the valve. Surgery was the only option 10 years ago. I and mean, what would happen is either a surgeon would repair the valve and kind of cinch it together, or put a ring around the valve to pull the leaflets closer together, or just take out the old valve and put in a brand new valve. And there's different types of valves or mechanical valves and there's tissue valves, and that's a discussion with a surgeon if a patient ever gets to that point. Now we have other options which we can do through an IV where we can repair the valve or replace the valve, and that's dependent on how significant the leaking of the valve is, where the leaking is coming from, if the annulus, which is the base of the valve, is dilated, or if the annulus is normal. And there's several research trials that are being done at different sites looking at the different possibilities for IV procedures to either replace, meaning putting in a brand new valve, or repairing the valve. And surgical techniques continue to improve over time. If you are a patient and you're diagnosed with severe mitral regurgitation and you're told that this is something where surgery is the only option, at that point it may be a good idea to get a second opinion at a larger institution that may offer different modalities because surgery may not be the best option for one individual patient. It may be the best option for other patients, but not specific ones. And getting second opinions where you have different options explained to you would be a good idea. I hope you enjoyed this discussion of mitral regurgitation. Enjoy your day.